Thank you, Zell. I was just asked, you're not going to take that whole five minutes, are you? We'll see if we can get through in that five minutes. He gave me a song. He is a song. He is a wonderful song to me. I have a brand new song. I have this, this idea of praise, this idea of worship is part of my life because of Christ. Because of God, because of who he is. Worship is a funny thing. When we try to wrap our minds around worship and giving homage and paying homage to a being that we can't even touch and see and feel, sometimes people look at it as so much foolishness today. But all through the history of mankind, people have looked for something to worship. There seems to be something made inside of us that says there's got to be more to this world than just what I can see and touch. There's got to be something that is in, in control of all of this creation. And our hearts long for something, some sort of answer, some sort of person, some sort of a being to worship. People have found their objects of worship in all kinds of things. People find still today their objects of worship in all kinds of things. And it's interesting, you will worship something, but we have a choice of who or what to worship. The God of the Bible, the question is asked, is he the one that we worship? Or should we worship somebody or something else? The God of the Bible, the one who spoke and created all this, people say, it just can't be, there can't be this being. And yet, I marvel that especially scientists are ever an atheist because of the wonder that God created around us. And the more you look into the steps of it, the more you look into the smaller pieces of it, the more amazing it seems. And I appreciated one man, he was a, some sort of a scientist, biochemical physicist, I don't know, he was some sort of a great scientist, quoted in the Los Angeles Times several years ago. As they're peeling back the layers of the, the cells and down into the molecular makeup of the cells and into the atomic, he said this, he said, I'm not, saying that there's a God. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't want to say there's a God. He says, but every layer we peel off, it looks like there's somebody looking back at us. He was saying, this can't be accidental. Even for the people, the scientists who say there is no God, say this can't be accidental. Something's going on here. And so when we meet Jesus in the flesh and blood, and we say, this is God, this is the one who created it all, it seems a little far-fetched to some people. When we say that God came down and humbled himself and made himself to be a man in this world, took on flesh and lived among us, that just seems too crazy to think about. And yet, if there's a God, and if we are his creation, you stop and think about it, it makes perfect sense. If he created us and wanted us to be with him, if he wants us to know him, wouldn't he do what it takes to provide that? What would you know about God if he didn't want you to know him? Anything? Nothing. <clears throat> Talk about somebody who could hide if they wanted to. God could disappear if you wanted to. We would never know a thing about him. But he has desired us. And he has wanted us. And so he makes himself known to us. And he says, this is how much I love you. I want you to know me. And so in John chapter 1, John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He said, nobody's ever seen God, but the only begotten has explained him. That Jesus came and explained who God was. He showed us, he lived in before us. 
And so we come to a time of year where people are celebrating the birth of Jesus. But they often think about Jesus, and, and this, is, this is important, but they often think of Jesus in the manger, this little baby. <clears throat> but they stop there. They stop with Jesus in the manger, and they don't realize that he grew, and they don't realize who he is. And it's very important for us to understand who he is and who God is. And so I want to share with you this passage from Luke chapter 2 where Jesus is born and the angels appear to the shepherds out in the field. This sounds like a beautiful story. The shepherds are out in the field taking care of their sheep. It's, it's dark. It's quiet out there. Maybe they hear the coyote off in the distance, the lambs, the sheep are making little noises maybe. And they're sitting around a fire and suddenly the angel of the Lord appears. And he has a message for him, and then all the angels appear with him, and they have a message for them, and the, the shepherds are, are dumbstruck, but they follow the instructions. They go into, into Bethlehem, and they find the baby laying in a manger. It's a beautiful story, but there's something especially powerful I want to focus on for the next couple of weeks out of this passage. Let's read it together. He says <clears throat> that there are shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And that's where I want to stop and share with you. The angels just made three statements to these shepherds. Three statements to you and me. Three statements to the world about who this God is and what he's doing. And we sometimes throw these statements away. It's just a nice phrase. But he said this, glory to God in the highest. Glory to him who is above all. He said, peace to men on earth. And he says, on whom his favor rests. We spent some time looking at these three statements over the next three weeks. But this first one, in the highest. What does Luke mean when he writes this? <clears throat> What do, what do the angels mean when they say this? There can be several different meanings the way it's translated. One, it can mean to praise him, to glorify him in the highest possible manner. To do everything within my being to praise God, to bring glory to him. Praise him in the highest way that you can. Praise him with your body, soul, mind, and spirit, with every breath that you have. Bring praise to God. Could that be applicable? Could that be a, a, a good translation? Yes. When we understand that he is the almighty God, he deserves every bit of our praise, every bit of our being. It could mean, be translated, to praise him among the highest, that he is among the highest. He is among the highest beings of all, it's not just among, though. He is the highest among the highest. The super, superlative of all superlatives. He is the best of the best. Most powerful of the powerful. It could be mean praise him in the highest heavens. Because that's where he is. There is no place that he cannot be. From the depths to the, the lowest of the depths to the highest of the highs, God is there. Praise him. 
glory to God in the highest. And then it can also mean glory to the most high God. The one who is not like any other. The God who is, again, the superlative of the superlatives. He is the best of the best. And so he says, starts this phrase, glory to God in the highest. Glory is this shining, this, this being that can't be contained, this glory. He steps into the room and the room lights up physically, emotionally, spiritually, where God is, it changes things. You remember when Moses went to the mountain and met with God face to face, he came down and his face was glowing itself. The glory of God permeated even his skin and he shone and he had to wear a veil over his face because the people were frightened. There's something about being in the presence of God, the glory of God. They say glory to God in the highest. He is full of this glory. Who is this man? Who is this God? Who is it we pray to? We need to know that. We don't want to get caught off guard like the CNN cameraman. You may have heard this. The fires, wildfires are burning in California. Cameraman from CNN wanted to get some close-up shots, aerial shots. He called up the local airport, chartered a small plane. They said, it'll be here, we're ready for you. He rushed down the airport and sure enough, there's a small plane warming up outside the charter office. He jumped in with his bags, slammed the door, said, let's go. Pilot took it to the end of the runway, turned into the wind and took off. After they got in the air, the cameraman said, let's head out to the valley and take some low passes so I can get some good shots of the fire. The pilot looked at him and said, well, what do you want to do that for? Said, because I'm a CNN cameraman, I've got to get the shots and get it on TV. It's an awkward silence. The pilot said, so what you're telling me is that you are not my flight instructor? <laughs> it's important for us to know who we're talking to. And so we don't want to get caught talking to somebody that we don't even know. So let's think about this. Who is this God that we pray to? Who is this God we sing to? Who is this God we gather here to worship? We read the story of different people as they related to God. And we look at them. We see Job. Oh my goodness. Job went through hell on earth. God allowed him to lose everything he had and to suffer immeasurably. And God and Job was angry. And he thought he had a right to blame God for his situation. And as we read the Bible, it looks like God was okay with that, that God kind of made a deal with Satan. God gave permission for Satan to torment Job. And so Job says back to God, wait a minute, I didn't do anything to deserve this. His friends told him, yes, you did, Job. You're just hiding it. Is there something terrible in your life? And he says, I didn't do it. God, this is not fair. And so we get to Job 42. Oh, Job 42 is when God finally answers Job and speaks to him out of the whirlwind. You remember the story? Job is angry. He's hurt. He's on the verge of turning his back on God. And God says, okay, Job, here, here we go. He said, you think that you're so good. You think that you're so smart. That you can be a judge of me. He says, you stand up and you answer me when I question you. He says, Job, where were you when I made the world? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in Job's shoes at that moment. Uh, God, I was, uh, 
He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth since you are so smart? Uh, uh, I, um, where were you, Job? Can you measure the sea in the palm of your hand? Can you plan the, the path of the lightning? Can you call the dawn in the morning? Can you? Where were you since you were so wise? You knew all this, don't you? And Job responds in chapter 42. He says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this who obscures my plans without knowledge? Job says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. But my ears have heard of you but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Who is this God? Job felt cheated. Job felt angry until he stopped. He was stopped in his tracks, reminded of who God was, and he repented. He said, God, take me and do whatever you want to with me. I trust you. Who is this God? The God who laid the foundations of the earth? Our creator? Remember Moses? God met Moses in a burning bush, said, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to deliver the people from, from Pharaoh. And he said, if I go there, they're going to ask me who sent me. Who do I tell them sent me? He said, tell them this. I am who I am. In the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, they use the word the being one, the one who is being. The one who is always. He was, he is, he will be. He is the one who, that never ceases. He is the all in all. The one, the being one. And Moses said, I'll go. And then Moses realized the greatness of God. David, he writes, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The magnificence. You go out in the starry night and you look up, get away from the city, and we are amazed that we see all the stars, we see all the handiwork of God, and we're amazed. But we don't know a, a fraction of what we're even looking at. We don't even understand the greatness of it. Do you, want, do you know what a light year is? Can you conceive of a light year in your mind? I have a hard time conceiving of a mile in my mind. A light year? Some of you guys know what it is. It's, I know what it is, I don't know how far it is. It's some trillion miles or something. And the closest star is how many millions of light years away from us. And yet, how do we see them? The closest one is so far away, we can never reach it. And yet, we see millions of them. And God has put them all in place. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then even in the model prayer, Jesus said, here's what you need to do first. When you pray to God, our Father who is in heaven. Sounds a little bit like what the angel said to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest. Our Father who is in heaven, what? Hallowed be your name. May your name be holy. May your name be held as holy. May your name be understood for what it means. It is a name that is above all names. May your name be hallowed. And we say, who is this God? Is he the creator? Yes, of course he is. He is the creator. And it's amazing, his creation. Again, how can a scientist who looks at the creation so in depth ever be an atheist? I, I don't get it. Except that there's a personal moral prejudice that doesn't allow them to see the obvious. He is a creator. How do we respond to our creator? Is he a lawgiver? And a judge? Yes. He gives law. He says, this is what life is all about. He gives us a manual to live life. He says, here's what makes it good. And what's amazing 
His laws make it good. Just the Ten Commandments, if everybody would live according to the Ten Commandments, what kind of a world would this be? You, you could throw away your keys. You wouldn't need them anymore. You wouldn't need a gun. You wouldn't need a policeman. You wouldn't need, if people lived by the Ten Commandments, it would make life good, wouldn't it? God does give law, but why does he give it? Does he give it to bind us in, to hold us down, to keep a thumb on us so that when you break a law, he can judge us and send us to hell? Is that what God's about? Some people think that. And I don't want a part of that God. But that's not the God we see in the Bible. We see a God who gives laws. The God who makes judgments that are just and equitable. That are right and good. Because he loves his people. Is he a savior? Yes, of course he is. He's a savior. But what did he save us from? Do you know what God saved us from? He saved us from himself. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why does he have to save us from himself? You read some of the atheist websites on, on, the, on the internet, and they say this is one of the things that draws them away from God so fast. How could you think that God would have to save, he, save you from himself? That doesn't make any sense until you stop and you realize who God is. Who is he? He's pure, he's holy, he is the God of all creation. He is the highest of the high. And no sin exists where he is, and yet we have sinned. And so God in his justice has to mete out justice. That's who he is. God did not have to save us, but out of his love, he gave his son to save us from his wrath so he could be just and merciful at the same time. What did he save us to? He saved us from death, separation from him. He saved us to what? To heaven. But he saved us what? to what here on earth? Over and over, the, the authors of the New Testament, especially Paul, they write and they start their letters saying, I, Paul, a servant of God or a slave of God, a prisoner of Christ. I am here not to do my own bidding, but I'm saved to do the will of God. He gives us a job to do. But sometimes we think about the baby in the manger and how nice it was that we had this little baby to take care of when really he's the one who came to take care of us and to give us a job. He's our friend, and companion. Yes, that's who God is. That's who he is. But sometimes we want him to be our teddy bear God. We want him to be the one who helps us sleep well at night, to take care of all the things in our life, to sand off all the rough edges and make things nice and smooth. He's our friend. He's the one who makes us feel warm and cuddly. And God doesn't always make us feel warm and cuddly. You remember when he met the people on Mount Sinai? What was his demeanor to, towards the people when they came out of Egypt? He wanted to love on them, right? And call them his people. But how did he meet them? With earthquakes and fire and rumbling and threats of death if you touch the mountain. And the people were so scared. They said, don't let God speak to us or else we'll die. We are so scared. Is that the kind of friend and companion you want walking by your side? The one who takes your breath away because you are so scared you don't know what, which way is up? Before we stop and say, he's my friend, he's my companion, he's my daddy, old buddy. Let's stop and remember who this God is. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, he's our companion. But he is God Almighty. And aren't we blessed that God Almighty will be our friend and live in us? Well, who is God? Well, he's my help in times of need. And he told me, come to him. And so I come to him when I need something. And here's where we're really good at God. <laughs> 
because we like to pray to him when we need something, don't we? We like to pray to him when we get sick. We like to pray to him when we lose a job. We like to pray to him when something goes wrong in our life and we say, God, fix this, please. He's our repairman. He's the one who fixes things. He's our help in times of need. Here's the truth. God says, call me and I'll be there. I will be your deliverer. I will be your shield. But don't think that I'm your Santa Claus either. I'm not the one to make everything smooth and rosy for you. Ask Job. Ask every one of the apostles who gave their lives for Christ. Everyone who followed him so faithfully and they died because of their following Christ. Ask Jeremiah as he was thrown into the cisterns and mud up to his neck because he spoke the name of the Lord. Are you the one who makes everything right, God, who, who helps me in my time of need? Yes, but sometimes we don't even know what our needs are. And sometimes we think of our needs in such a petty way. And God says, I want you to see things from a bigger perspective, from my perspective, and understand that I am God. And Job, when he saw that, Job said, I spoke too soon. I spoke without understanding. I didn't know who you were. I thought you were there to provide for me everything that I wanted. I'd forgotten that you are God Almighty and that your ways are above my ways. And so the angels appear to the shepherds at night and they say, glory to God in the highest. And we stop and we do a gut check here. We say, what are they talking about? What is God up to? That this whole act of sending the Jesus to the earth is an act of God this almighty God. It's not something that we deserve. It's not something that we came up with. It's not something anybody could have imagined. All the gods are talked about, all the religions of the world, none of them have a God humbling himself before his sinful people. Nothing matches what God has done for us. And so what do we do because of that? It's another case of mistaken identity. The story is told about the captain of a battleship. You probably heard this story. They're, they've been out doing maneuvers through heavy seas. It's dark, and they see a light up in front of them, and it's not moving to the right or left. That means they're on a collision course. And so the captain hails the light. He said, <clears throat> we are on a collision course. Divert your course. 20 degrees to the north. Response came back. No, you have to divert your course 20 degrees to the south. The captain responded, I am the captain of a battleship. You will divert your course 20 degrees to the north. The man came back. I am a seaman, second class, and I am a lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> we have to know who we're talking to. The lighthouse was guarding the rocks. And every one of us are heading towards some rocks. But God has made a way around the rocks. He's made a way over the rocks. He will take the rocks out of our way when we put our trust in him. And he's made a way to do that by putting our faith in him, by accepting the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, who died and paid the price for our sin, so we don't have to sh be shipwrecked on those rocks. Do we have the hope of living with our creator forever? Of being where he meant for us to be, that we realize that this life is just a beginning, and we give thanks and we give praise to him and we live our lives every day because of what he has done, in response to what he has done, in a way that brings glory to him for what he's done and for who he is. Glory to God in the highest. What does your life do today that brings glory to God in the highest? 
Is the way you deal with your family? Is it the way you deal with your neighbors? Is it the way you serve somehow? Think of ways that you and your life brings glory to God. He has gifted every one of you in such powerful ways. Use your gifts to the glory of God if you have never given your life to Christ. God has gone out of his way to love you and to give you hope for the future, that this life is not all there is. He says, what I want you to do is trust in me, turn your life over to me, and let me give you the guidance, let me fill you with my spirit, let me do the things in you that you cannot do by yourself, let me be the power in your life, but it takes surrender. The picture he gives, the method he gives, is through baptism to die, to be buried into the death of Christ, through baptism into his life. He says, so that you can be raised to walk a brand new life, just like Jesus did. God gives us great hope, but he says you can't do it halfway. Come to me all the way. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, we want to help you do that today. But there might be things in your life, you're saying, my life is not bringing glory to God. It is not glorifying God the way he needs to be glorified, and I need help with that. And our elders are standing in the back right now, ready to meet with you, to sit down and pray and take this matter to God, because God wants you to live an extraordinary life so that your life can bring glory to God. If we can help you in any of these ways, Come down here while we stand and sing this song.